Thank you all for coming out on what by Boston standards is a pretty darn nice Friday afternoon in November. Uh, I'm Gary Lawson, the Associate Dean for Intellectual Life here at Boston University School of Law. And something more than a dozen years ago, uh, Jim Fleming, when he held that title, started the happy, uh, dare I say it, joyous tradition of honoring the publication of books uh, by faculty uh, with events like this. And today we are thrilled to be doing that for Jay Wexler's Weed Rules, Blazing the Way to a Just and Joyous Marijuana Policy. Copies available for purchase around the corner, signatures available to my right, if I may commit him to Good that. Pictures. I'll draw a picture. Okay. Now I am by any standard absolutely the wrong person to be moderating this event. Not only have I never inhaled, um, I have never imbibed uh, of the demon weed, uh, not in any form, a liquid, I mean, solid, liquid, gaseous, doesn't matter. Well, that's not entirely right. Um, on page five of his book, Jay makes reference to the parking lot outside a Grateful Dead concert in 1978. My first Grateful Dead concert was 1979, uh, two more following that. But the 1979 concert was indoors at the old Seattle Center Coliseum. So 45 years later, I'm guessing my THC level would probably still fail if Boston University wanted to implement a drug testing. But, but apart from that, uh, it's not my, not my thing. Fortunately for all of us, we have an amazing panel that is eminently qualified to talk about this book. And I emphasize that the purpose of these events is not to present published papers, but to have dialogue, discussion, deliberation, celebration, generally have a good time. So we have with us, and I'm just going to go in alphabetical order, uh, we have Scott Bloomberg right, uh, from the University of Maine School of Law. Uh, he teaches, among other things, uh, cannabis law. Uh, I gather this is, he has had three different stints in Boston in some capacity or another, including a stint at uh, Foley Hogue, uh, where he actually uh, uh, specialized in privacy law and cannabis law. And he has published an article on something that Jay touches on in his book, uh, which is the relationship between the Dormant Commerce Clause and possible uh, marijuana legalization if Congress lifts the federal ban. Right? Uh, we also have Kay Doyle to Jay's immediate side, a uh, BU law grad, uh, as it turns out, right? Uh, from 2017 to 2020, she was uh, Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commissioner and has since gone on to become a director of government affairs for Green Thumb Industries. I gather the second largest marijuana company in the state, more or less, okay. Uh, and finally, we have Julie Steiner, also a BU Law grad. Uh, we didn't do that on purpose, it just happened that way. Uh, she is uh, at Western New England, uh, not only a professor, but also uh, the director of their Institute for Legislative and Government Affairs. Uh, if I count correctly, uh, she is a seven time uh, Professor of the Year award winner at two different institutions. And in 2021, published an article in the Boston University Law Review uh, on something else that also shows up in Jay's book uh, that is the expungement of uh, criminal records in a post legalization environment. So we are delighted to have them here to help us talk, celebrate, eat. And with that, I will turn it with each panelist. We'll just we'll talk for a few minutes. Uh, if this turns into a Friars Club roast, we'll give Jay the opportunity for a rebuttal. And then hopefully we will have time for a circulating microphone to go into the audience uh, to continue the discussion there. And with that, I am done. <laughs> Scott, would you like to start the proceedings? Professor at the University of Minnesota. Just want to start thanking BU 
today and here for inviting me here uh, to speak about this wonderful book. Um, so yeah, I have, I'm, I'm the only person on this panel without some connection to BU Law. So I feel like I have to establish my Boston chops a little bit. Uh, so uh, I've lived, yeah, I've lived here a few times, but most recently I, I was working at Foley Hoag, which is a big firm in the Seaport District, as you may know. And as I was leaving the firm to, to go into academia, uh, I was talking to a partner there named Dean Richland, who's kind of an old school guy. And I told him I was gonna be teaching cannabis law and he said, wow, we didn't, we didn't have that when I was in law school. I said, Dean, you did. It was called criminal law. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he chuckled at that. And, you know, I, I think, I think uh, times have changed is the moral of that story. Times have changed. And, uh, you know, I, I, just turning to Jay's book, um, I think Weed Rules is, is a particularly valuable contribution to the field of, of cannabis law. Um, the book does really a, a wonderful job of identifying the various values uh, that are at stake when states legalize and then regulate cannabis. Uh, and, then, and then the book unpacks how these different values can be drawn into tension with each other and how we need to pick amongst competing values in, in deciding what rules we want to have in place to, to regulate marijuana. Um, and I think, Jay, the, the, the biggest testament I can offer to the value of your book is how I've incorporated it into my own teaching. Um, I don't, don't mean to make you blush, but uh, so, so this year, so I teach a cannabis seminar. It's a, a small paper seminar with about 15 students. And to open the, the class this year, I asked the open-ended question to, to identify what values we want our cannabis policy to reflect. And you know, sure enough, the students one by one start raising their hands and, and they populate a list that ends up looking a whole lot like the list in Jay's book, right? Uh, social equity, access, normalization, public health, public safety, and yes, joy, joy, right? We, we want to celebrate the joy of cannabis. And then throughout the semester, as we begin evaluating different policy choices that states can make with respect to, to licensing, with respect to track and trace, with respect uh, to, to what barriers to entry there should be to the marketplace and so on and so forth, we return to this list of values and we ask what, whatever policy the, the student is advocating for, I ask them to justify it based on which value or values they think uh, it, it fulfills. Um, and so I think, I think if 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 nothing else, Jay, you should know that at least one person is incorporating this book into their class, and I, I'm thinking that I'm not alone. I think I'm not alone in that. Um, the other thing that I think is particularly valuable about Weed Rules is how well written it is. Uh, weed Rules manages to do something pretty rare with academic books, which is that it is academically interesting and publicly accessible. And, and this will come as no surprise to anyone uh, who has probably had class or met Jay, it's also really funny, like genuinely funny. Um, and I, I want to just kind of read a, a passage from the book, which I thought was particularly funny. Um, and if you're following along, this is on page 57. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> In, in, in this part of the book, Jay is sort of critiquing the, the notion of uh, a marijuana abuse, um, because when we talk about drug abuse, right, often drug abuse is, is, is of course, a very serious thing and a very serious social problems. Um, and there is this, this, uh, this tool called the DSM-5 tool, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth version of that tool, uh, which psychiatrists use to diagnose substance use disorder. And Jay lists out the various factors uh, that, that psychiatrists are supposed to consider in assessing whether somebody has a substance use disorder. You know, they're like, uh, substance is often taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than the patient intended. Persistent attempts or one or more unsuccessful efforts made to cut down or control the substance, craving or strong desire or urge to use the substance, and so on and so forth. And Jay's point is that when you apply this to, to cannabis, uh, it doesn't totally make sense. And so Jay applies this to his own life. And he says, 
Take the survey for yourself and see if you meet the diagnostic criteria. I certainly do. How could anyone who uses marijuana more than sporadically not meet them? Of course, a few of the symptoms would be concerning, such as numbers five through nine. Certainly be a problem if I was missing work, right? Deans, it would be, that would be a problem. <laughs> uh, or putting themselves in a hazardous situation. So have to go. <laughs> <laughs> but many other symptoms are practically just symptoms for using a lot of marijuana. Do I crave the substance? Of course I do, it's awesome. <laughs> if I stop using it, will I feel anxious or have trouble sleeping? Of course I will. I, in part, I use marijuana to help me sleep and feel less anxious. Do I spend a great deal of time using the substance? Only if most nights counts as a great deal of time <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? And he concludes that on the basis of these answers alone, he has uh, a, a case of cannabis use disorder on the brink of being severe. And then he says, but so what? Substitute cheese for cannabis, and you'll find that I also have a moderate case of cheese use disorder. <laughs> so um, so like Gary, I, I don't use uh, marijuana, although unlike Gary, and for the sake of normalizing marijuana, I should say I've smoked a lot of weed in my life, uh, not for a very long time though, um, but I definitely have cheese use disorder, <laughs> no question. And if you wanna start a support group, I'm happy to do that. We can meet at whatever delicatessen you think is best. Cheese rules. Cheese <laughs> rules. That's a, the follow-up book. Um, but the, the cheese use disorder example, I actually think reveals something a little bit deeper about marijuana. And that's how unique it is. And, and that's what really interested me about, about marijuana and, and, and made me interested in, in teaching marijuana. At the same time, it's a schedule one substance, which is supposed to have a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. And yet most people who have used it would say that it's not really that dangerous. And something like 40 states have now legalized it for medical use. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's a substance that is uniquely both federally illegal and legal at the state level in many states, which creates this really fascinating federalist relationship right? That doesn't really exist in any other area of law or with respect to any other type of substance. So um, I guess to wrap it all up, Jay, it's a wonderful book. It really is. I really recommend picking it up. And I'm glad you wrote it because it's really enriched my class. Thank you so much. No correct order. Anyone, if we go alphabetically, it would be K, but there's nothing in the, sure. nothing written in the stars about that. I'll, I'll break up the professor lineup since yeah. I am the only one here on this panel who uh, is not a eminent professor. So um, unfortunately, I'm just a lawyer who, um, after graduating BU, ended up um, working for a law firm that represents most of the cities and towns in Massachusetts. And I developed an agriculture specialty. So when um, the cannabis uh, ballot initiative for medical use rolled around, the law firm looked around to figure out who would handle it. And it's a plant. So the plant girl's gonna handle it. And that was me. <laughs> so that's how I got into cannabis. I wish I had had this book back then, or indeed at any of the stops on my weird cannabis law journey, because um, I was the first government employee in Massachusetts to be paid out of cannabis revenue. Um, we launched the medical use of marijuana program in an environment that I don't know, grudging tolerance may be too generous. <laughs> um, very hostile tolerance would be more accurate. And um, fortunately, as adult use rolled around in 2017, the environment got a little less chilly, but I still had a legislator calling me a dope dealer. So there are a lot of very strong feelings about cannabis still, even though as Scott points out, Ohio just became the 24th state to uh, legalize for adult use. And we're approaching 40 medical use states, not even counting territories or possessions. So the country is tipping towards a cannabis reality that I think some of our policymakers aren't on board with or in a state of catching up with very reluctantly. And I agree completely with Jay that we should be 
uh, looking to more joyously embrace what is inevitable, I think, at this point. Um, and I can't take credit for this analogy. Um, I, I heard it at a conference and thought, this is fantastic. This is exactly right, having been a regulator. But planning your first set of cannabis regulations is very similar to child proofing for your first child. You are going to lock the crap out of everything, regardless of how realistic the threat is. And to give you an idea, I am the idiot that put a clamp lock on the cabinet over the refrigerator because somehow I convinced myself that baby Jack would be able to scale up there and get in. Um, ironically, these days, apparently, that is one of the most common places to store your cannabis because children don't actually get up there. But you know, once you get to your second, third, or however many children you end up having, you do have a better sense of what about cannabis is actually hazardous. And one of the things I think is important to recognize is the fact that workers, you know, we we all are more likely to end up on the corporate or government side of cannabis, but there are people who are going to be in the grow rooms, in the trim rooms, et cetera, who may be exposed to environmental toxins. And let's face it, weed isn't just weed anymore. We also have um, infused products from hemp that are getting made largely without regulation. And Scott actually referenced the fact that we have a situation where on the state level, cannabis is legal, on the federal level, it's illegal. In a growing number of states, that's actually the other way around for hemp derived products. States are, due to the lack of federal regulation, states are regulating hemp derived products and limiting or banning them and getting sued. Um, stimulus package for lawyers. And, um, you know, it's legal at the federal level. So, you know, issue number two may have to be a more expanded version of weed rules to keep up with all the various things that are going on with hemp as that evolves. I would love to see a second edition. I'm just plugging away. <laughs> um, but it's, it's when you figure out what is hazardous and worker exposure to various contaminants, various aerosol things. And I encourage if you're interested in the cannabis area to read the um, report that was just issued by the Massachusetts uh, Cannabis Control Commission yesterday, as well as a CDC report talking about those issues, because I think that's another area of, I hate to say employment, but you know, a, an area where lawyers can be useful in holding companies like mine accountable uh, and making sure that the people who work for us are properly protected. And, you know, it's an important thing to do. It's an important thing to look at the environmental impact of cannabis as much as we would all, you know, love to see rules that, you know, allow cannabis to thrive. We also have to be conscious of the fact that we are in an environment where climate change is real and we don't want to have this product contributing to that. So I, I think that is one of the areas in the future uh, that would be an amazing opportunity for attorneys. And so um, I'm just grateful for the, the pathway that Jay has provided. I only taught law for one semester, but if I was to go back to uh, that journey, this would definitely be a part of the curriculum because it is such a, as Scott said, accessible, witty examination of cannabis policy. Well, good afternoon. No. Can you hear me if I talk loudly? So um, as you heard, we are here to celebrate joy and exuberance, two very important themes in Jay's Weed Rule um, book. And I'm overjoyed to join Scott and Kay and Gary and certainly Jay um, to celebrate his book launch. Um, and I might take you up, Gary, a little bit on the Friars Club roast, which I think is very, you know, very apropos from this book, as you'll see. So we will talk about this book, Weed Rules, why weed rules are necessary, why not, why all 
lead rules are not necessary, why some are great, why some lead rules are bad and some are very, very bad. Um, in fact, they've had catastrophic consequences on humanity and it, it's, it's gotten to the point where we need co corrective weed rules to remedy them. Uh, we've, we're gonna talk about what weed rules Jay would write if he were the sort of weed czar or the king of the weed rules. Um, and, you know, we'll be talking about, you know, because of the joy and happiness, as Jay points out, that weed brings to the user, why weed rules, you know? And I think, you know, Jay's book covers all of this and more in appropriate depth and entertaining fashion. And by his own cheeky admission, uh, he wrote this while only occasionally under the influence of weed or maybe cheese. Maybe cheese. Um, <laughs> oh, I know he's so, yeah. fond of both, right? But in all seriousness, um, his book makes, as, as you've heard, a really valuable and much needed contribution um, to the existing and, and kind of sparse body of developed cannabis law and policy. And so, you know, believe it or not, there is this dearth. And, and, you know, as you've heard, you know, it does make an important contribution. I've also incorporated it in my cannabis law class. Um, so, you know, I think Jay's overarching point is, you know, our current approach to cannabis policy is a reaction to our history and to this, you know, kind of the fear that you heard uh, Kay articulate. And so it's one of what he terms grudging tolerance, borrowing from some history. Um, and he advocates that that should rightfully be replaced with what he calls careful exuberance. And so, you know, and he, and he really, you know, asks us to embrace joy as a valid policy reason to support legalization. And, you know, he breaks careful exuberance down into the two component parts. You know, we should be careful because there are public health risks indeed. But nonetheless, we should be exuberant because after this lengthy history of discrimination and irrational policy, we're finally at a place where we can begin righting the wrongs and making the country a more joyful place when weed is in it. Um, and as Jay points out, who other than Idaho doesn't like weed? <laughs> um, now, grudging tolerance still is the dominant approach in states that have legalized. And so, um, you know, he, he sort of terms grudging tolerance as the state saying, okay, it's legal, but we're not gonna make it easy for you. And we're not gonna make it something you can easily access. Um, and we're not particularly happy about this legalization. So um, now I will say, that while I agree with almost everything in the book, I wanna say at the outset, there's one thing, I'm sorry, Jay, that I don't agree with, and I'm gonna read it to you. He writes, many excellent books have been written about the history of marijuana prohibition in the United States. This, however, is not one of them. And I totally disagree, you know, I think, um, not true. This <laughs> is an excellent book. And, you know, Jay deftly boils down intricate history to its core. He highlights complicated constitutional issues with elegance and clarity and, and humor. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I laughed out loud, even when learning about the dreaded dormant commerce clause <laughs> experts about which sit on this panel. Um, his Brief history of marijuana prohibition hits all the points necessary that sets up his policy approach. And he emphasizes the history of racial animus and the, the scientific ignorance that really characterized, you know, the convoluted history that led us to where we are today. And he has this cut to the chase style um, that really enables him to cover a lot of ground in exactly 200 pages. Is that by design? I mean, I found that to be quite amazing. Um, and that's because he really has uniform mastery of constitutional law, cannabis law, and legal history. And he can distill that information down into like its essential extracts and then translate it into what is actually a page turner and you know he, he's really developed a book that is quite brilliant and like cannabis brought me immense joy as a reader. Um, so you know, for example, and this is just you know, 
as someone who teaches in this, to have this done in what are pretty succinct pages. He explains the complicated issues involved in federal supremacy of the Controlled Substance Act over conflicting state law, um, express and implied preemption, the 10th Amendment's reserved powers clause, the 10th Amendment's um, anti-commandeering doctrine, and then he applies all that knowledge to a system that has simultaneously, as you've heard, prohibited cannabis at the federal level while legalizing it in many states. Um, and he accomplishes this feat in just over five pages of text, which I found remarkable. Um, he later provides an overview of Fourth Amendment search and seizure, and he identifies and addresses three key questions, just boils them down and explains you know, you know, how that the whole regime works. Um, and ultimately he makes throughout the book really important policy, you know, sort of builds the groundwork and makes really important policy observations. Like after the fourth amendment discussion, he observes that courts are not the right drivers of this policy ship um, for many reasons, including, you know, the speed or lack thereof at which they do things. And he really calls upon the states to proactively enact statutory law to make clear that police officers cannot search or have a dog search a car or a home without probable cause to believe that an actual crime was committed involving marijuana and not just that someone has legal possession of a small amount. And um, I will say Jay has a way of picking just the right citation um, or illustration and can kind of nimbly alternate between the likes of Erwin Chemerinsky or Carl Hart or, um, you know, Scott Bloomberg, he's in there, um, while giving lengthy textual attention to the South Park Medmen episode. And he cites Stan, Stan's nincompoop father, and he gives a direct quote to a cartoon character called um, Tally, who's a talking towel with addiction <laughs> issues. So, you know, <laughs> full, full credit to you on that, some nimble scholarship. And I also learned you ignore Jay's advice in here at your peril, because Jay admonishes the reader, um, do not Google scrumeting, which I, I ignored. <laughs> And I will tell you, I will never unsee the scrumming video that I watched. So ignore it at your peril. You may need to explain yes. scrumming. <laughs> well, it's both screaming and vomiting at the same time. <laughs> Don't Google it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in true law professor professor fashion, he starts with an assignment for the reader. And what he does is he asks the reader to imagine that they work in a non-joyous state that has not yet legalized cannabis and then have them draft detailed legislation like, uh, like Kay had to do um, and contain within that legislation all the components of a sound legalization scheme. And of course this exercise would turn, uh, you know, any would be reader slash legislator, you know, set them floundering. But Jay actually throws us a really important lifeline and that's the one that Scott mentioned um, and, and one that alone makes a substantial contribution to liter the literature. And that's by giving this list and explanation of the 10 potential criteria that might be relevant to evaluating any appropriate marijuana policy. And, um, you know, Scott mentioned them, so I won't go through them now, but, um, you know, Jay's point is sound policy, you know, gasp requires that we make choices ideally before we act that are based on thought out criteria. And, you know, he gives us this common language that will lead us to more productive conversations and hopefully more thoughtful weed, weed rules. You know, um, I'll let him explain what I thought was another really cool thing, which is that he uses this, he's sort of this visualization of an audio equalizer with knobs and each person would have their own personal preferences about these 
10 criteria. Maybe, you know, one person's going to slide social equity up on the scale the way Jay does. Somebody else, you know, ha might have a different type of personal preference combinations. Um, and, you know, he has a really, just to me, very cool way of understanding how to think about, you know, the balance of these particular things and how they change from person to person or group to group. And while he equivocates a little bit on home grows, he does so because the issue is a tough call. You know, he's got social equity permitting access and serving as a check on monopolies and delays on one hand, home grows, you know, help do all that. But on the other hand, when you have home grows, it makes it difficult to catch, you know, illegal or illicit product. And so, you know, of course, he manages all this in his laugh inducing style. And he concludes, quote, probably states should allow home grows, although ask me tomorrow if I still agree. <laughs> That's pretty classic. Now, Jay spills some ink on social consumption, noting that while weed might be everywhere, um, we don't have adequate places to smoke it. And his solution is, quote, for states to allow the creation of public spaces where people can come together in a social setting without stigma or having to hide in an alley to use their recreational drug of choice or the medicine that makes it possible to live their lives. And I know this is personal for Jay, who appears to have smoked in alleyways. And if you're wondering, you can just Google Jay Wexler smoking dope in alleyways and then click image and see what pops up. You're welcome. Um, he has a particular disdain for sure um, for unnecessarily cumbersome and often irrational advertising or promotion restrictions. And he identifies this as one of the hallmark characteristics for what makes a grudging uh, tolerance regime. And so I had a, a good story to share with you. I'm, I'm getting near the end um, to illustrate the reality of this and also my emphatic agreement with Jay. And that's that a few uh, nights ago on my way home from work, I um, I thought, you know, instead of getting Jay a card, I'm going to get him a small token um, of something to give a sort of congratulatory, you know, token to him to celebrate weed rules and um, I may or may not have stopped in a weed store in order to check this out. So um, as I went in there, I approached the bud tender and I explained that we were here to celebrate um, a cannabis law professor's book launch called Weed Rules and asked if he had any products you know, that would fit with the theme. Like maybe you know, there would be some gummies called bookworm or I mentioned, is, do you have any strains that would possibly be called weed rules. And the bud tender looked at me and said, we can't say weed rules in Massachusetts. And, you know, I thought that really says a lot because on the menu in this very place, you could buy acid dough, chem dog OG, of course, dumpster cake, haze fried ice cream, but weed rules which contains the colloquial reference weed is out. So, you know, hmm, can't say weed rules, but can say acid dough. And that type of irrational regulation really carry, you know, characterizes grudging tolerance. And so last but not least, since we're on grudges, I'm just going to conclude by airing two. And, you know, just why not end a talk about joy with a low points, right? Um, but just to set it up, I, um, I think, Anyone in the audience that has ever watched a TikTok video that would be like a life hack video that teaches you something that you always wanted to know um, can relate to this. Like a life hack would be if I took a wrinkled shirt, threw it into my uh, dryer with five ice cubes, you're going to get all the wrinkles out. It's something like useful that you needed to know and it kind of blows your mind when you learn it. But when you learn it, you're kind of pissed off, and I think we, we heard this a little earlier, that you didn't have the information earlier. So Jay, I, I agree with what was said. 2023, really? <laughs> could have could have used this in 2016, but I will take it now. Um, and last but not least, I've got a little bit of a grudge with my timing. 
when I was here at BU. It's like a grudge with myself because while my education at BU Law was fantastic and it prepared me for the practice of law and it prepared me to teach, um, first, when I went to law school here, the law tower did not look like it does on the inside. Um, it really looked like an outdated and smelled like an outdated gym locker. We were talking about that earlier. <laughs> and when I went to law school here, hardly any lawyer would dare admit that they, you know, certainly to another legal professional, that they ever smoked weed. And most importantly, when I went here, Jay Wexler was not here and I never got to take his weed rules course. But at least now I have his book. And to, to the students in the crowd, you are here at just the right time. You not only have this glamorous interior, but you have a phenomenal faculty that includes among others, Jay Wexler, and you get to take his weed rules course and read his fantastic book, which I commend. Thank you. Thank you. So Jay, now that we've pointed out all of the deep substantive flaws in your scholarship, <laughs> how are you going to defend yourself? I think if we were talking about my deep flaws in my scholarship, this would be a lot longer than a one hour program. But uh, <laughs> I just want to thank uh, I just want to thank all of you uh, so much uh, for 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 coming first of all and for your s such kind remarks uh, about the book. I uh, when I'm writing I'm writing these books I'm uh, I just feel like I'm trying to I'm threading the needle where I'm I'm writing something that's sort of too goofy to get any sort of academic uh, recognition and too sort of uh, professory to get anybody pot to read it. Uh, so which is a kind of a hard line to. Uh, needle the thread, but uh, so it's very nice uh, to hear uh, such kind words about the book, and I'm uh, just particularly glad that it's uh, being used in classes in cannabis law. That's terrific. And Kay, I, you know, you, it, it's really a catch twenty two. Uh, you wish that it was the book was written in twenty sixteen, but I wouldn't have been able to write the book without you <laughs> teaching me, uh, uh, coming to my class and uh, and teaching uh, the students and myself all of this stuff that I didn't know when I started teaching it, which I was only seven years ago. I remember um, Weed Rules, of course, is not the name of the course, but uh, the associate dean at the time when I invented the course recommended that that's what I call it. Fred Tung, who I don't think is here, uh, was the associate dean. And I said, can I teach this course? And he said, uh, yeah, I think you should teach the course and call it Weed Rules. And I thought, that's fantastic, Fred. But uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have the uh, the current. In fact, the the former dean didn't even want me to call it marijuana law uh, because, and I thought that was because the word marijuana is itself a, 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 a kind of has racist origins. If you know the story, it's it started um, uh, Henry Anslinger, this terrible racist uh, guy who was the head of the Federal Bureau of uh, Narcotics in the '30s and. And he uh, racialized uh, the term cannabis. He, he said it was marijuana. It's this foreign thing as part of the way of demonizing cannabis. And so that's why I thought I wasn't allowed to call it marijuana law. But actually, it was just because Maureen thought it sounded frivolous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but that's that's OK. Um, so and I also want to thank Gary um, uh, and Jim Fleming, who came up with the yeah. this idea, which is a really uh, a remarkable uh, thing that we we do here at the law school for 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 people who write books and we celebrate them and that I think that's unique and Jim came up with it many years ago and Gary has carried it on through his uh, time as as uh, dean for intellectual life and and put this together and I want to thank you very much for for everything you do at the law school it's quite amazing um, and thank you all for coming too. Uh, and I look forward to, to talking more about uh, about cannabis law with whatever questions you may have. If you has anybody Googled scrumming in the past? <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Uh, it's really true. Uh, although you know it is, it, it's it's worth noting that there are even though I love weed and everything, it is true that there are public health concerns with cannabis, and scrumming is uh, a, a a symptom of hyper what is it called hyperemesis hyper yeah. and it doesn't hit many people but the people it hits uh whoo <laughs> my er doctor friend says haldol is really the only thing that and hot water hot showers yeah, hot yeah. showers apparently is uh, really the only thing you can do for it i luckily have not gotten that um uh any of that from my smoking on my I, actually these days i smoke on my i crawl out the window 
uh, my and stand on the and go on the on the um, the 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 fire escape because I'm like, you know, you can't. You're not allowed to use cannabis in public. I'm just stream of conscious thing here. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to use cannabis in public. Of course, you can, um, uh, but you're not supposed to. And it and 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 it's very. There are many places you can't use it inside either. Like if you, my condo is smoke free. So. Um, Plus, I, you know, my wife doesn't want me smoking weed in the house so much. Uh, so what do you do? You, there's no place to go to smoke it, right? Um, which is the social consumption point, uh, which, you know, we might end up solving within the next 10 years or so. But basically what uh, what you have to do now is we crawl out the window. I did it last night, uh, you know, and just stand on the, on the and and because it was a warm night, you know, uh, and um, or in the alleyway by the dumpster. And that's, uh, I've smoked. Uh, behind many, many dumpsters, as I think many of us have. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'll just, I'll stop there <laughs> with that important uh, observation and open it up. That was like questions. the perfect end. Okay. Don't you think? I do. Perfect. Right. I'm going to give the panelists one more chance before we circulate a microphone through the audience uh, to get uh, to get your involvement. Does anyone, or should we just go straight to the, straight to the folks? Yeah. Let's hear from the people. Let's hear All from right. the people. Okay. And we do have a, Elizabeth over there has a circulating microphone. And I have, by the way, a whole list of really obnoxious questions. <laughs> so you have to chew up 32 minutes with your questions to avoid that. Yikes. A wise, wise Please. woman. Okay. <laughs> yeah, dormant <laughs> commerce <laughs> buzz. <laughs> okay. So, um, I was going to ask Jay a softball, but I'm warning you, I'm not asking you a softball. I'll leave later. I'm sorry. I know. Um, no, so my question has to do with what's next. Um, and I've been reading about um, psilocybin and psychedelics and medical uses for those. Um, and I'm just wondering if the panelists have thoughts on how to do that well, given what went wrong with cannabis and what they think about, and maybe Jay, what you think about Here's the softball. What do you think about psychedelics? <laughs> uh, well, I'll just say a few words and then uh, and then uh, hear from the panelists. I mean, psychedelics is definitely the next thing. It's the next chapter. In fact, it's here, um, right? Uh, we just had a, a lawyer speak uh, uh, from the Vicente law firm, uh, the big cannabis law firm, speak in, uh, in the in the cannabis law class yesterday, and that law firm is now has a psychedelics you know department basically, and they're getting ready. Oregon has legalized, uh, and they're working through uh, their regulations now. I think I'm not. They're not done yet, are they? No. Um, and Colorado is legalized, and it's going to be on the ballot in Massachusetts in 25. And, and and there's some interesting similarities and differences with cannabis, uh, things that make psychedelics more complicated. I think uh, there's 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 a, right now there's a debate about what the model for legalization of psychedelics should look like and whether it should be like the cannabis you go to a retail store, you buy it, you use it at home. Or should it be more like you, you like in Oregon, the Oregon model is you the state licenses facilities and facilitators to uh, basically administer this uh, psilocybin to, to, to patients who come in and, uh, and, and so it's all under supervision. And that's another model and some people like that model. Some people think there should be both models. There's also uh, a, a, a big part of the psychedelics debate is about indigenous use of psychedelics. That's a big part that you, you is not quite the same, right, with cannabis. Um, uh, in fact, I think there's there's the isn't there there's a movement to not legalize peyote, for example, because peyote can be used by uh, Native American tribes and has been for you know I don't know hundreds thousands of years, and so the idea that it would be opened up now to uh, uh, to to the general population, which might diminish the resource, um, is a, an issue. There's also a, 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 an abuse, a sex abuse angle to psychedelics because there are um, there you know pe people go into the therapeutic in, under the therapeutic model people are completely incapacitated during the session and there have been instances of, of abuse you know during the session and so there's a movement for example to make sure there are two people in the room at, at, at all times so there's little pieces that are very different and I think we're right at the beginning of trying to work out how those all fit together into the new the new policy but uh, other thoughts. I'd say one sort of 
similarity, but we're also seeing like a little bit of a quicker movement on this is, you know, how it generated is much like cannabis. It started from the people, you know, the legislatures were not the precursor movers of the ship. It was the people standing on street corners, collecting, you know, signatures on ballots, getting those ballots in front of, you know, the state in front of the voters, basically. And that direct democracy ballot initiative really led the, the show and, um, you know, legislators only got involved later on. Um, and, you know, psilocybin, psychedelics, we're starting to see that too. It's starting more as a grassroots movement, but now we're seeing, you know, more comfort level where legislatures are getting involved earlier on than we saw in cannabis. Okay, I saw a hand from the Philip S. Beck professor. Thank you. Uh, well, I did. I haven't read the book yet. I just bought it. My, my purchase card wouldn't work for some reason. So I actually spent my own money. So I expect a rebate of the royalties. Um, but but I'm not signed. either in kind, maybe you could, you know, anyway. Uh, but, um, you know, this, I, I've always been in favor of, of decriminalization of drugs just because of the police uh, policing aspect of it. And, and that goes across the board. I, I just don't understand why there's any such thing as an illegal drug. Uh, there should be treatment for people that have addiction problems and there should be uh, taxation and uh, elimination of all the crime would be a major boon to society. So I've always been, but I'm not so sure that I, that I view increased drug use as joyful. And this is what I'd like to hear people, you folks have read more about marijuana than I have. I grew up in the I was a teenager in the 70s, so it was a lot easier to get marijuana than to get beer when I was in high school. Uh, I mean, you could get it in any bathroom in the high school. You couldn't get beer except by going to a liquor store and bribing someone to go get it for you. So, um, But uh, I just wonder if it reflects something about our social situation that it's, become, it's becoming more acceptable to use mind-altering substances uh, because somehow the world is so bad that we need to alter our minds in order to survive. And that's a really, I know that's a downer in a joyful yeah. situation but i just wonder like how you feel about that like is the what is it is it really the 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 increased hope for joy that drives this or is it really the increased need for distraction well i mean it doesn't that it depends on the person right i mean i uh or the person's particular mood sometimes i use it for joy and sometimes i use it because of the news or both right um you know so but why do we have to choose right um uh, I do, I do find it to be, uh, I do find uh, cannabis in particular to be uh, joyful because what it does for me, and this is not for everybody, like everybody has a different reaction to it. But for me, I can be in a really, really bad mood. Uh, if I drink alcohol when I'm in a really bad mood, I get in a worse mood, right? <laughs> and, uh, but if I use cannabis, uh, the root mood actually turns around. Like I could be there like going grrr, and 45 minutes later, I'm dancing. Like, woo like that's, that's amazing uh, to me. Like uh, I can't, and, and, and I use, I should say, I use edibles usually unless I, when I'm not on the fire escape. And so, and the edibles take, you know, 45 minutes or an hour to kick in. And that's just a great 45 minutes because you know it's coming, right? You know, and, and you can't believe you can't believe it. You're like, I am so sad right now. And but I know in 45 minutes I'm gonna be dancing. You can't even imagine, and then it happens. Um, and so for me, that's for me, but you know, uh, uh, can people should people use it because they watch the news and it's just awful and it makes it dulls everything? Yeah, that people do that too, and that's fine, right? I think, but it's just up to each person. Okay, so I mean, since I spiked the lunch, does that mean we've got about five minutes until you start dancing? Okay, then we'll look forward to that. I thought I was feeling yeah, a little funny up here. You know? <laughs> um, I, I understand the concern about increased drug use, and we certainly um, heard that a lot from uh, the substance abuse specialists when we were first um, doing listening sessions for um, adopting the adult use regulations because, you know, these, these you know, good-hearted people are sitting there battling it out, especially with teenagers in trying to make sure that they don't um, ingest substances that could really hurt them uh, prior to their, their brain fully developing. Uh, but one thing we should acknowledge is that cannabis is also displacing other harmful substances, you know, there, you know, and, and 
Dr. Grinspoon's one of the people who talks about um, the effect of cannabis on your body is uh, apparently, and I'm certainly not a medical doctor, but apparently less harmful than what alcohol does to your body. Now they tell me having a glass of red wine every weekend for a long period of time. But, um, and there are, you know, debates in science and among scientific communities about whether cannabis can help you um, withdraw from opiates, for example. Um, there are people who absolutely swear by it and there are people who it doesn't work for. So there are reasons other than sheer joy <laughs> to use cannabis. And one of the realities of it is how I first started working in cannabis is helping patients access it. You know, my mother went through a, a horrendous time dealing with cancer and chemotherapy. And uh, when we were first putting the medical use regulations together and not sleeping, you know, and, and having midnight phone calls to try and address the concerns from different um, legislators or other agency regulators, or even within the Department of Public Health. One of the things we had to keep in mind is not everybody is, because there was a lot of talk about, oh, medical marijuana isn't real. This is just a bunch of stoners pretending to go to the doctor so they can get access to a product that should be illegal. And so we, we had to talk about the fact that there are people who really rely on this just to be able to function and not in a cannabis use disorder way, in an alleviating symptoms of another terrible condition kind of way. And I don't work there anymore, but one of the prouder moments uh, in my life as a, a cannabis lawyer was when GW Pharma got Epidiolex through the FDA because that is a drug that helps children combat horrendous seizures. And it was the first plant-derived medicine to get through the FDA. The FDA, if you don't are, aren't familiar, it is considered the gold standard around the world. And so for a plant-based cannabinoid drug to get through it, I mean, there should have been ticker tape parades. This is amazing. It's that difficult to do. And the hope for the future is this is going to be something that just develops more and more, that cannabis can be made accessible, not just through the state stores, but also in a insurance covered, you know, way that really like takes in mind the, the drug drug interactions and all the other things that can come from taking anything. So I understand there's concerns about increasing drug use. At the same time, I'm comfortable with the fact that there are always going to be downsides to anything and the plus sides of um, making cannabis available to me overwhelm those risks. I'll just say um, it's not always joyful for sure. <laughs> you know, scrometing is an example, right? Um, but what's interesting about it is we don't, in if you read the law's upon legalization, the purpose clauses hardly ever say we're going to legalize because people like to get high. And I think, you know, when I took Jay's point, I'm like, we should just be able to say that that is a, a just and appropriate reason. If you look at them, they'll say something like, we should legalize to collect taxes. We should legalize to curb the illicit market. We should legalize for social equity reasons to, re to remedy what's now happening and abysmally uh, in the enforcement arena with disproportionate impact. We should legalize to have safe products. We should legalize for medicinal reasons. But you're rarely going to see what is really going on for many people just like it is for alcohol. And that is people like to get high. Not everyone, but some people, <laughs> many. And just just to bring it full circle, right? I think this conversation comes back to the various values that Jay outlines in the book, where one of the things that you do need to consider in crafting marijuana policy is problematic use, which does exist. Um, but you have to weigh that about, against all sorts of positive benefits, right? And so I think when you when you do that analysis, you can put rules in place that make for easy access and normalization and social equity and all of these things, um, and also have some some guardrails, right, to safeguard public health and things like that. So, yeah. All right, I did see another hand near the front row that 
then went down. Uh, I'll, I'll Elizabeth, you go ahead. Whatever <laughs> I'm saying out of it. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, thank you for this talk. Um, I'm from California. Back in 2016, my dad was on that front push to get the cultivators' licenses. Went from investment banking to indoor cannabis growth. So, so. Um, it's been really interesting to be out here for so long and kind of see how different that market is and stuff. And it was interesting, Kay, when you brought up how hemp is so unregulated and Delta 8, Delta 9 out here and something like seeing how many hoops you have to jump through with how high your concentrations can be and like how heavily regulated cannabis is in California. Um, and then coming out here and seeing kind of it being sold everywhere and ha people having no idea that it's not necessarily the same stuff. Um, I'm curious why that is, because it's very contentious in California, at least, which is kind of cannabis heaven, so to speak, um, you know, Delta 8, Delta 9 at all. I mean, we flip flop all the time on if it's legal or not. I mean, it's really back and forth. So just kind of curious why it's a little bit more prevalent out here than it is on the West. Yeah. Uh, so it's basically a state by state issue because uh, when the 2018 Farm Bill was enacted, there was a relatively last minute, I think, amendment, not just to allow hemp, you know, the, the actual biomass um, that everyone thought was gonna be made into rope. And in fact, the phrase in Congress to sell it was, this is gonna be rope, not dope. Didn't- Industrial, industrial yeah, hemp. Industrial right. hemp, yes, you know, exactly right. You know, the, these are big ropes and, you know, hemp apparel, et cetera. And quite the opposite happened because, you know, they had done such a good job hyping this that a, a lot of farmers got interested and wanted to grow hemp and it created a glut in um, what they all thought they were going to be selling, which was non-intoxicating CBD. And there was way too much of it. And so if you have way too much of anything, you know, supply and demand, the prices crash and they needed to find something to do with this to be able to sustain, you know, their business, their farm, whatever. Uh, and they figured out that if you, you know, take it, put it in um, a vat with some acid and heat it up, um, it will turn into Delta-8, which is a supposedly slightly less intoxifying version of Delta-9. And um, away it went. And we saw all these Delta 8 shops or, and they're discovering cannabinoids, you know, constantly. So I'm going to use Delta 8 to coll colloquially refer to probably a whole host of cannabinoids that are in these products. Unfortunately, and, and something to know if you have friends that are using these products is when you do that process of turning CBD into whatever, um, there are a lot of byproducts generated that scientists can't even identify. And so if you can't identify something, you have no idea what its safety profile is. And so people are ingesting this stuff and honestly, even experts in it, you know, I talk to experts all the time. They don't know what it's going to do to people years from now, or even immediately. There haven't been any stories of, you know, acute health um, from mere consumption, unless there, it's been contaminated, but we have no idea what the long-term effects are going to be. Whereas cannabis, you know, generally it's been used thousands of years. We have a fuzzy idea. Probably hasn't been tracked the way we do in modern times, but that's why essentially the, the farm bill authorized it. Unfortunately, the FDA has decided they are unable to regulate it, at least at the moment. And when the FDA sort of stalled on regulating it, a lot of states have decided to step in. And if you're really bored and want something to do, you can follow the litigation that's going on against each state because there are about 10 lawsuits right now challenging different states' attempts to regulate hemp. And we've just um, seen a law of appeal filed in Virginia in the Fourth Circuit that may actually create a circuit split and so <laughs> we could have Jay reporting from the Supreme Court uh, if they take up a, a, any case that evolves from that circuit split. It's funny because I, uh, when I first started, I started getting into this. Uh, it's so complica complicated with the THC nine stuff uh, that I basically said to myself, "I'm not going to learn hemp because it doesn't get you high, so who cares?" Uh, and now, <laughs> of course, now it's become this big issue where. Uh, and now I feel like now I don't even know about this stuff. Fourth Circuit, all right. Uh, yeah. We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi. Um, as somebody who's from California, went to college in Idaho, and then <laughs> moved back to California after, um, I'm really curious just to hear each of your perspectives about what your message would be to legislature in the four states where there's no, like, where it's, like, fully illegal, and just, like, what you would share with them, like, information-wise. You mean the the like Idaho, Nebraska, that like the places that are, there's no le legal use yeah. at all. What do you mm -hmm. tell them? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so right, I was jokingly referring to Idaho because Jay uses Idaho as the sort of shining example. But right, where like Idaho, I, I might I'm always off by a state or two, but like Nebraska. Idaho, Nebraska, Indiana, Kansas, and Tennessee are like on my checklist. Um, uh, you know. I'd say, don't worry <laughs> so much. You know, I don't think the sky is going to fall in and there's been enough of a states as laboratories approach to, to not worry so much. Um, and I think, you know, more than anything, laws should reflect popular will. You know, that's, that's sort of the, the bottom line with something like this. They should have a level of reflection of that. And, you know, I think that they're lagging behind the general popular will. I guess a few things. Um, first, I'd give them Jay's book. Mm -hmm. um, and second, I would remind them that it's not like people aren't using cannabis in their state. Like it's still happening everywhere, and they're probably you know under under enforcing it uh, a, a bit. I hope they're under enforcing it. In fact, um, but the the fact that it's being used everywhere suggests they should probably either. Well, they should they should legalize it because then you can at least harness the benefits of its use um, from a tax perspective. And that's not like the argument I would normally lead with, but I think that's a persuasive argument to legislatures who are otherwise reluctant. Um, the only thing I'd be curious to know, and I, I'm just going to ask the question of the panel, you know, I'll, almost in, in every state and, uh, and, and for a long time in every state, um, marijuana was legalized through ballot initiative. And, it, and that's been true in like deeply conservative states as well, where you wouldn't otherwise think the population would support, frankly, a liberal reform agenda uh, like that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if the, the states that have been the holdout states, do they just not allow ballot initiatives or do they have some really restrictive ballot initiative uh, rules or, or is that just unrelated? If anyone knows. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. You need it. Yeah. Right. yeah. Let's co-author. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. that sounds a great question. Collaboration. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, and the states involved are conservative, so this this argument may not land for them, but I think, you know, Scott's right. The cannabis use is there. Um, regardless of how the state law deals with it. And so one argument to make to legislators is to say, look, this is a public health issue. Cannabis is a bioaccumulator. Back long, long ago, it was used to um, clear fields of contamination because when you plant it, it sucks up the contamination from the soil it's planted in. Um, and that's before you've even sprayed any kind of pesticide or goodness knows what's on it. Um, you know, if it's an illegal grow, it's not going to be tested. It's not going to be subject to the kind of very strict, sorry, public health regulations to make sure that people consuming cannabis are doing it in the safest way possible based on the knowledge we have now, which let's face it is probably in its infancy. We'll probably, you know, as cannabis research gets better and better and more involved, we'll, we'll know more about what is appropriate to do as you're growing cannabis. So allowing your citizens to, you know, consume a, a plant that is potentially contaminated and not get any taxes for it, but then have to pay with for any health consequences that come from that contamination just doesn't seem like good business to me. I guess just one other thing. It's always good to make states jealous of each other. And in a lot of these states, like people, some of it for sure is 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 illegal grows, but some of it is just people are going from Nebraska to Colorado mm -hmm. and buying up, you know, a bunch of marijuana and bringing it back into Nebraska. And so they're giving tax money to Colorado. And if you want some corn huskers to to legalize marijuana, I think that's a pretty good sell. <laughs>
for those who weren't aware, Nebraska sued Colorado, yeah. right? Uh, Nebraska and one other state next to Colorado, like one of these awesome original jurisdiction suits, you know, in the Supreme Court. The, the court decided not to, they just said no. But uh, but it was, it was, uh, it was, it could have been one of those great, you know, um, cases at the Supreme Court that's like a college football score, you know, like uh, Colorado 14, Nebraska 7. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Hi. Um, I just want to congratulate you on this, first of all, because, you know, it's a book obviously needed to be written and you have kind of the perfect point of view and it's just a great thing you did it. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. The second thing I want to say is I'm, I'm just kind of curious um, how people deep into this field, which is the panelists, feel about kind of... Um, the state of scientific research on this subject. And part of the reason is, you know, I haven't delved deeply into it, but I every piece I have read about it feels like advocacy, whether it's on the pro-cannabis side or the anti-cannabis side. And I understand that, that there's, you know, the I understand exactly how the federal restriction has negatively influenced it. But I feel like there's a lot of discussion about how the that has negatively influenced it, and maybe not enough discussion of how the desire for the billion dollar industry has also influenced it, and um, just how different that those research studies feel than, like I spend a lot of time in research around things like nicotine or, re, you know, which also has an industry, but, oh, and around, I have my whole career spent a lot of time around the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and um, I had a conversation recently with somebody, um, a public health researcher about the youth risk behavior survey on this hypothesis. Um, Canada has a youth risk behavior survey as well. And they ask about daily use of substances and use at school and work, whereas, I'm, I'm sorry to be too in the weeds, but <laughs> the youth risk behavior survey says, you know, they have for adolescents ever used and last 30 day use is kind of a prevalence measure. And in Canada, what you're seeing on the daily use stuff is that cannabis really is different than alcohol for adolescents because adults use alcohol on a daily basis, but adolescents don't use alcohol on a daily basis, but they do use weed on a daily basis and they do use it at school and work, which is undetectable from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So I said to this researcher, well, what maybe you should just add a daily use question to the use risk behavior survey. And she's like, that will never happen now because that survey is so political and people are aware of this issue. And so it will never make it onto the survey. I was like, wow. I mean, it seems like kind of an important question. So I just wonder how you guys think about the science. There's a lot out there. I mean, that's sort of circling back to the basic to that question. The science kind, the reports feel very advocacy to me. Uh, so yeah, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, the way I dealt with it in the book is, um, you know, I agree that like trying to master the science, uh, you know, the studies are coming out uh, and they're, they're spun by the, the advocacy groups. Um, there's for every study that sh you know, shows increased use, there's another study that shows decreased use. What I decided to do um, for the book is, is th there are a couple of, very comprehensive uh, um, reports that seem to me quite measured uh, by people. I mean, I could be wrong about uh, uh, about this, but it, but the two reports that I looked to was uh, one report from 2017 by the National Academy of Sciences, and one by the Rand Corporation sometime since then, and uh, and they. You know, purport to have looked at all the studies out there and to make some conclusions about which, you know, which conditions, for example, there's a lot of evidence to show, you know, support some evidence, you know, no evidence, and same thing on the harm side. And so they they seem to be fairly measured and avoid the advocacy. Both of these reports, I mean, at, at least on their face, seem very uh, reputable and non-biased as much as it can be, they can be. And they, and so, and their conclusions are mo somewhat moderate. They're like, yeah, for, uh, there is some evidence, definitely evidence of harm 
to kids uh, developing brains, for example. There is some evidence of uh, increased accidents uh, from DUI. Uh, there is some definitely a strong evidence of help with uh, um, nausea from chemotherapy. There's very good evidence on spasticity from MS, for example. And other things, it's not so clear. And, and so that's, I, I use those uh, for my science. Uh, that's how I handle it. Um, the kind of the best you can do. Like, I'm not gonna, ma I, I don't know if anybody could, you know, master all the science. Although Peter Grinspoon's book is, 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 is a, 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 a advocate in the cannabis space though, for sure, um, is, is a, there's a comprehensive book that he just wrote about, but it's very, it's it's balanced, but he has a bias too, which he so uh, it's a hard, it's a definitely a hard issue, but that's how I dealt with it. Yeah. So I think one of the challenges with cannabis evidence, and of course I tend to approach things with regulator head because it's very hard to divorce yourself from it, is um, when you're drafting regulations or legislations, you want to tax or make difficult the things you don't want, and you want to incentivize the things that you do want. And unfortunately, historically cannabis research has been heavily incentivized towards prove that it's bad in some way. So there's a, a lot of evidence on that, but it's still low level evidence. So um, I, I know you've already Googled scrometing, but if you're not familiar with the pyramid of evidence, there is different levels of evidence in scientific research. A lot of the evidence around cannabis tends to be low level evidence because when you get to those higher stages, you know, the clinical trials, et cetera, it costs so much money. I mean, that's why the pharmaceutical industry is the way it is. I mean, it costs, you know, sometimes a billion dollars to develop one drug using one molecule. We're talking about a very complicated plant. Botanical drug development is incredibly tricky. So in case any of you are under the illusion that the marijuana companies that are operating in states have that kind of money to fund clinical trials, we don't, <laughs> not even close. So um, there is going to probably need to be more incentives created, more reason for investors to want to do this. And you know, it's a joy to speak today about Jay's book, because usually I'm speaking at conferences that sound like this, the International Cannabis Derived Pharmaceuticals Conference. And what that tends to be is um, a bunch of people trying to figure out whether or not to take their client's money and invest it in what to them is a potentially risky proposition. And that is one of the reasons why cannabis science isn't as far along as it is, is because it's been disincentivized. And even now that those most of those hurdles have been at least ameliorated, it's still tricky and incredibly expensive to do. I think we can sneak in one more. No, there was somebody I, near the front. I happen to have the mic. Well, there was somebody near the front who was. Uh, I think Kay almost just answered the question I was going to ask. No, uh, if sense. Stephen Dean were here, he would ask a tax question. <laughs> He's not here, so I'm going to ask an IP question. I, I currently talk about Prozac in my IP class, but I have nothing at all to say about cannabis. Um, I see a lot of people are getting patents related to various cannabis innovations. I've never seen anyone enforce one of these. Never seen any trade secret litigation. I, I wonder, in the IP world, is there any enforcement activity? And you know, the connection to pharmaceutical industry, you know, makes me think there should be, but I am unaware of it. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, uh, give me a little bit more info about IP and uh, cannabis products. Um, well, I think there has been one trademark case, but it is around hemp. Um, AK Futures out of the Ninth Circuit um, discussed whether or not hemp, uh, uh, hemp, I'm trying to remember what exactly the facts of the case were. Please feel free to Google that too. We're just giving you a list of things to Google today. But um, essentially what they were deciding was whether or not Delta 8, I think, could be trademarked. And because that was determined by the Ninth Circuit to be a legal product, they were able to trademark it. With cannabis, my understanding, and I'm hoping some of my fellow panelists can help me out here, uh, typically the, at least USPTO has been reluctant to grant um, trademarks and potentially patents, I'm not sure about that, 
because of the status of cannabis as a class one drug. Patents are okay. Patents are okay. Patents are okay? okay. And there was a case. There, there was one, there was a, a patent infringement suit that maybe got settled. Because uh, I remember it being in the news and I don't- I, The outcome. Uh, yeah, um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's coming and it, it almost happened or there was a suit, but it didn't go anywhere. Okay. So we do, we have plant patents. I mean, the beginning, nothing went through. You couldn't get anything through the, the patent office, but then we did see plant patents emerging. And the government, as, as mentioned before, is starting to patent things, you know, so, you know, we are seeing patents, but litigation is like, yeah, well, I, I not- Nixon, he might have got a little blog saying, come to us for your legal guidance on getting your, your marijuana patents. <laughs> so they're out there. They're out there. Legal, yeah. just, just, it's probably worth mentioning that the United States government holds a patent on on cannabis and its beneficial medical use. I can't remember the number, but everyone, people in the movement know the number and they have their shirts with the number on it, right? Number 420. No, it's number 420, right? It's not that patent number? Different number. Okay. Can, can we cheat and sneak in one more question up front here? I don't know if we, we're, we're at two o'clock, but uh, I know there's someone who's been on the queue for a while and I would... I would love to be able just to sneak him in before we, before we conclude. Hi, um, I just wanted to kind of ask how you, how the international cannabis legalization movement you've seen differ from the domestic one. Um, I know it's gaining popularity in Germany and other European countries. I'm just curious what the differences you've seen have been. Uh, I'll just say two things. One is. Uh, there's Canada and Mexico to some extent, I think, have, uh, you have legalized as a result uh, partially of Supreme Court decisions on constitu constitutional law, Mexican and Canadian constitutional law. The other thing, uh, I mean, it, it was legalized in Canada legislatively, but there was it, the basis of medical cannabis was constitutional. And the other thing I'd say uh, is Uruguay uh, is a fascinating counterexample to the United States. It's very, uh, that was the first country that, that legalized cannabis as a nation, and it did it very conservatively, where you, uh, tourists can't use it. Uh, it's not really about making money. There's no advertising. Very interesting model. 